I would, uh, I would like to say first, it's very hard for me not to make a joke about the weather this morning, and uh, I'll try to, uh, I'll try not to. Uh, bonjour, mon nom est Fernand Gervais. Je suis uh, vice doyen à la faculté des études supérieures et postdoctorales à l'université Laval, mais aussi uh, dans le rôle aujourd'hui de directeur uh, enseignement et apprentissage à la fédération. Et je vais agir uh, ce matin comme modérateur pour la session qui va suivre, dont le thème est « Transformations in Undergraduate Education Beyond MOOCs uh, ». Today, we have the privilege to have here with us uh, three distinguished presenters uh, who will each uh, address this theme for about 10 minutes. We will then move to questions and discussion with the audience afterwards. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, so it's perfect. Les présentations vont se faire dans l'ordre suivant. Uh, tout d'abord, uh, Professeur Thérèse Laferrière, puis Professeur Dilip Soman, et ensuite le Professeur Vivek Venkatesh. Nous allons donc débuter avec la, la présentation du Professeur uh, Laferrière, et je vais vous la présenter uh, brièvement. Thérèse Laferrière est full professor of pedagogy at l'Université Laval. She is conducting a number of design research projects, including ones related to the Remote Network School Initiative in Quebec, network-enabled communities of practice, and knowledge-building communities. She was the leader of the research team educating the educators within the Telelearning Network Centers of Excellence, NCE Canada. Her research activities focus on network learning environments, and especially teacher-students interactions and peer interactions, as electronically linked classrooms become reality in elementary and secondary schools, as well as in, as in faculties of education and post-secondary education in general. She is an associate researcher at the Institute for Knowledge, Innovation and Technology at the University of Toronto. She is currently the director of CRIRES, a multi-university research center on successful schooling. She served as Dean of Education between 1987 and 1995. She was President of the Canadian Association for Teacher Education and President of the Canadian Education Association in 2001 and 2. She was also President of the Association, uh, the Association Francophone des Doyennes et Doyens, Directeurs et Directrices d'Éducation du Canada. Alors, permettez-moi de vous présenter Thérèse Laferrière. Alors, bonjour. Merci, Fernand, mais c'était trop long ce que tu as dit. Là. Ça a pris une minute. Là. Euh, je suis ravie d'être ici ce matin. Je suis ravie d'avoir entendu euh, Mme Fortier nous dire ce qu'elle nous a dit. C'est une grosse question qui est posée. Hein. Ce que vous voyez là, là Beyond MOOCs, MOOCs, c'est la dernière invention. Hein. C'est dans notre langage. Hein. C'est juste un petit peu au-dessus des cours en ligne. Bon, je vous en dirai un petit peu plus euh, tout à l'heure. Alors, essayons peut-être là de, de faire un peu un tableau général de la situation. J'ai le privilège de parler en premier. C'est rare que la lettre L pour la ferrière se trouve être la première en liste. Hein. Merci à mes collègues. <rire> Alors, euh, je vous donne mon point de vue là, sur, sur la situation dans laquelle nous nous retrouvons. Alors, euh, on va activer ça un petit peu. Hop, on va passer celle-là. Alors, voilà. Uh, this is our playground. OK, our work ground, I should say. I think we all recognize that. Huh? Teaching as an art, teaching as a science, oh boy. Huh? We keep moving from one end to the other. And I think it's a good thing. Uh, it's good that sometimes we go on the right side a little bit. Quite often, we are on the left-hand side. And at the vertical level, I put teaching as private and teaching as collaborative. I think we can all locate ourselves if we think of one particular seminar we gave, one practicum we gave, with also all our courses. We can probably locate ourselves someplace. And maybe there is a dominant area for us. Just think about that a minute. So where we are, and where we see if we are in an administrative position, where we see our faculty, our department, our university mostly being. Where is our activity located? I will see it's over there. This is the most highly populated area. 
could be an on-site course, can be also online teaching. But most of what we do, when we talk about innovation, we are right down there on the left-hand side. We think it's innovation because we use new technology, you know, PowerPoint instead of overhead. Same thing, just a bit more sophisticated, because a bit more, that's all. It's really where we are. And then a few Canadians invented the MOOC, the first MOOC. And I just want to recognize that. That was a pretty nice study that came out in 2010, financed by Shirk and colleague we know. And also we can include Stephen Donnie's also into that. There's a nice vision into that. Huh? <laughs> so we have the bubbles, our individual teaching with our own private classroom, closed door. And then we have some networking going on. At this point, we talk about mobile learning, students going and searching on the web, Googling at the same time, whatever, chatting, whatever. Just an attempt to make a connection. But I think this, from all, all like we can hear about MOOCs these days, I think this is one of the nicest. And I want to recognize their work. Let's come back here to our areas. Okay, so what's on the right hand side? So what are we doing on that side? And what's happening? So let me point to the two major trends in my understanding of what's going on as we integrate ICT into teaching and learning, as we try to enhance teaching and learning with technology. This is a better way to say it now. More and more, we don't focus as much on the technology, and we focus more and more on the affordances of technology and how we can use them. And the concept of affordances is extremely important in this respect. En français, je dis souvent, pendant longtemps, l'écran fait écran. It doesn't sound the same way in English, somehow it doesn't come across. But quand nous disons en français que l'écran fait écran, c'est qu'on arrête à la technologie. Et là, on pense que toutes nos pratiques, ça ne marche plus parce qu'il y a une technologie. Moi, la première, au tout début, moi, j'étais une prof d'interaction dans la classe, OK? Quand j'ai vu arriver ça, technologie, tout ce que je savais sur les dynamiques de groupe en classe, psychologie des groupes, toute l'analyse des interactions, c'est comme si je me défendais d'utiliser ça, parce que maintenant, il y avait des nouvelles technologies, pas on allait dans le numérique. C'est pas vrai, ça. Il faut garder ce qu'on sait faire de mieux. Et il y a juste un déplacement vers le numérique de temps à autre. Moi, je préfère des expressions comme la classe en réseau de Network Classroom or the Network School. We refer to that a bit ago. So let's, let's see what's there. So the first trend is the personalization of learning. This is big and it's going to get bigger. And with the technology, it's happening. The other one, collaborative learning. These are the two major trends. You hear a lot of today about mobile learning. Well, it's just technology. It just means that it's flexible. You can access it more often, all the time. Doesn't mean that this is the best thing to do <laughs> in a teaching learning situation. Okay, now we move a bit closer to what things are. Okay, what's increasing at the vertical level? The complexity of problems. Whether we talk about the knowledge society, knowledge economy. Problems are more complex. We need to solve them collaboratively in almost all spheres of activity. What's happening at the horizontal level? Well, the growing demand. Huh? Of course, technology is improving. Diminishing funding, we refer to that. So, remember the previous slides, what's on the right hand side? At the bottom, private teaching, a bit teaching as a science, a bit of that. So what we have right now, and what's happening a lot, and we are MOOCs, most of them are, partnerships for delivery of information. Who is in the partnership? 
We all know our realities about this. It's geared toward independent learning. There's a bit of collaborative activity. And we hear a lot of anecdotes about students meeting on site in order to understand what the online course is all about, whether it's a MOOC or not. All this belonging to the trend personalization of learning. At the collaborative level, a bit higher up, it's always difficult to go up, but if we are here to talk about transformation, well, we have communities of knowledge, ideas. It's the theme of the day. It's going to be the theme next year also. It's going to be part of that. Um, one thing, however, we think it, it belongs to university people. I agree. But I put forward to you that we begin that at the elementary level. It can happen at that level that. We have communities of practice if we think about practical knowledge also. That's collaborative learning, knowledge creation. So that's on the right hand side. Well, this may be part of the agenda, at least in my understanding, but uh, I, I have to be very modest and tell you that in 2000, this is what we had in mind during the telelearning network. Was it realized? Hmm. Bits and pieces. For a while, when Shirk funding was there, of course. Huh? So we had four universities there. I had a colleague here, Alain Breleu at McGill, and uh, I hope Alain jump in today and come here for a little while. And uh, the partnership with Toronto is still quite active. Uh, with UBC, well, almost not at this point. And you know, it's because if we want to go the collaborative route, we have to face our own internal organizational structures and policies and ways of doing things. The technology, it will be there. It will become, in a very short time, you know, it's ubiquitous, uh, you know, connectivity. And the issue is not there. It's almost not there anymore. The issue is our practices and our policies. For instance, in Quebec, for years I've wanted that the financing of universities, well, I have just a little voice, but I, I, I'm even going to say it today, um, that we need an incentive for collaboration among universities. The affordance 15 years ago, 20 years ago, was that we were able to start collaborating. We have almost not done it. And I think it's a course we have to take. It's not the only one, but it's a course we have to take for the 21st century. I have very specific measures I will take, but I won't talk about it today. So it's almost not happening. Kripik tried a long time ago. At least some of the people at Kripik, but who want to move forward? Chickering. Let's go back to Chickering. We are not even there. You know, often we bounce on an on-site course with an online course saying, oh, it's much better on-site. We do this, we do this, we do that. But very often we don't even meet four of the characteristics that Chickering and Gamson put together in 87. So if we want to move forward, this has to be part of it. Blended learning, yes. Online activity, yes. But face-to-face -face also. But to teach a course in front of 100 people, just the setting we are in almost, it's nice to see one another. It's a social dimension. It's not the information, because the information you can get before or after, whatever now. So what would be the added value in the classroom? What's the added value of coming here today? That's the social dimension. That's the connectivity. If we want to move forward, that's one possibility. They localize information and community. Now the technology affords us to do that. There are many, many social technical designs. I'm not saying technical design, I'm saying social technical designs. And we need, and this is where MOOCs can go, partnership for collaborative research and teaching. More and more we are doing it with regard to research. We have the partnerships. We work with others. 
teaching, almost not. We don't need many MOOCs in the world. We need MOOCs around those who have created and built on the ideas and all their networks. And now we can connect that. We can have activity on site locally and all the way to those who develop the theory. In my own case, I see two possibilities in this regard, and I hope that in the future we'll move toward that. So, that's my last slide. Teaching as private, where we are, where we may go. I see three ways of learning. One being flexible learning, the student having more and more the choice of context, learning at home, learning at the university. The choice of content, all this movement of open educational resources. Open learning, that's one way to go also. And the third possibility, the most difficult one, likely, connected learning. Increasingly, the learner will have the choice of community and the leaders in the community. Let's think here about communities of knowledge and communities of practice. So this is what I wanted to say. Merci, Thérèse. Permettez-moi maintenant de vous présenter euh, Professeur Dilip Soman. Dilip Soman est un behavioral scientist et fait des recherches sur les comportements humains et les applications de choix d'architecture, de consommation, de la santé publique et de la littérature financière. Il est professeur à la Rotman School of Management et à la Monk School of Global Affairs à l'Université de Toronto. The director of the University's India Innovation Institute and the coordinator of the Behavioral Economics in Action Research Cluster. In his past life, he has degrees in engineering and management, worked in sales and advertising, consulted for several organizations, and taught at Colorado, Hong Kong, and now in Toronto. When not working, he spends time on photography, reading, taking weekends seriously. <laughs> I like that and agonizing over successive Indian cricket teams. So, Professor Soman. <laughs> Thank you. So somebody suggested that I do a MOOC on cricket, and maybe that's going to be my next topic. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here, uh, despite the weather, uh, for a number of reasons. One is this is a topic that is near and dear to me. I spent a lot of time designing a MOOC, delivering one. Uh, I'm on a task force at the university on sort of thinking through some of the ideas that you just talked about. Uh, so this is all interesting. Uh, but the other big reason that I'm delighted to be here is I, you know, I go to most conferences. I get to be the academic in the room. I'm the one presenting charts and regression equations and frameworks. And, and I always envy the, the practitioner who comes in and shows pretty pictures like that one. Uh, and in the context of MOOCs, I am the practitioner. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is spend a few minutes talking about my experiences with the MOOC world and how I think MOOCs can or cannot uh, help uh, thinking through some of the transformations that you talked about uh, in your presentation. Um, I've also been involved in a little bit of research in this area, uh, my first baby steps, and that's through a Gates Foundation funded grant through the MOOC Research Initiative. And, and what we're doing there is studying the notion of blended learning and whether that's effective or not. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and I'm happy to answer any questions on those topics. Um, as Fanan mentioned, I direct the India Innovation Institute at the University of Toronto, and one of the things that we study uh, is the notion of frugal innovation. How can we innovate in contexts where resources are thin, uh, and in fact, the costs of failure are high? And, and a lot of Asia, or the global south more generally, is a wonderful lab for doing that. Uh, in, in the traditional world, we think about innovation uh, as something that happens in a lab. Uh, we encourage innovation by allowing people to fail. And India is quite the opposite. There are, there are very little resources. The cost of failure are high. And one of the areas we have been studying is the area of education. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that uh, and hopefully give you some perspectives on that work. Uh, Whenever I think about my own MOOC, I always picture my students doing that, um, sitting on the edge of a cliff and, and, and connecting with me. But I somehow don't think that that 
that's what happens. Uh, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off by, by presenting my conclusions, or my concluding thoughts, because you'll probably throw me off the podium before I get there. So claim number one uh, is a MOOC is not just a MOOC. Right? And what I mean by that is that there are many, many other benefits of doing a MOOC, uh, not just to the interactive learning that we do at universities, but in general, in helping teachers become better teachers. And I'll spend a few minutes on that. Uh, and secondly, uh, the best way to scale and improve the quality of education is through efficiency, and MOOCs have a large role to play uh, in terms of efficiency. So this is sort of the, the general idea uh, of frugal innovation. How do we make our resources more uh, efficient? Uh, and then I'll add a third claim, and that's purely my opinion, but uh, I thought I'll express it. Every single educator should go through a MOOC-like experience. It is transformative in many, many ways. Uh, and, and I'll share my experiences in terms of why uh, that's the case. So uh, let me briefly touch on the MOOC that I taught, just to give you sort of the lay of the land. Uh, it was a MOOC on behavioral economics in action. It was on behavior change. Uh, I offered it on the edX platform in collaboration with the university. Uh, and it was a six-week course. It basically had three modules to it. Uh, the first two weeks touched on principles from behavioral sciences. The second two weeks touched on methods. And the third, uh, third module touched on applications. And so it was, a, it was a MOOC that had content. It had math. And I had to teach people how to run experiments and analyze data. And they had to do projects where they applied the learnings to a real life situation. So it had a little bit of everything. And, and so that also let me think through you know, the effectiveness of MOOCs uh, at each of these three different things. And so uh, the key idea that I, I conveyed there was, as you said, my research, which is on choice architecture. How can we change the choice environment in such a way to help people make better choices is, is, the, is the general idea. Uh, we had about 40,000. Uh, students that registered for it, uh, many of them from Asia and Africa, which was interesting uh, because uh, most of the other MOOCs in, this, in the economics and finance area tend to get a lot of registrations from Europe and, and North America. Um, 7, 000, roughly 8,000 students finished the MOOC in the sense that they accessed every single piece of uh, data that was out there. Uh, we ended up giving out 2,500 certificates, which in the MOOC world, I understand, is a, is a fairly uh, good conversion rate. Having never taught a MOOC before, I was disheartened by the low percentage turnout, but it, I was assured that that wasn't a bad thing at all. Um, and what the students had to do to get a grade in this particular class was they had to participate in online debates. Uh, in which we had sort of fairly senior folks from governments and the areas of policy and academia that presented different viewpoints. The participants got to go online on a discussion forum. We had uh, you know, sessions in which there were voice sessions. And so they did that. They did your standard quizzes. They did a self-reflection piece. And they did a project. And so again, the entire spectrum of deliverables uh, in that particular MOOC. Um, so what did I learn? So let me start off with what I learned uh, as opposed to what the students learned. Uh, because to me, th that was the big takeaway. So the first thing I learned was preparing a MOOC is a completely different ball game from preparing any other class. And, and you spoke about the difference between teaching as an art and teaching as a science. And I know exactly what that means. Right? So a lot of the themes that you talked about, uh, how do I customize the experience for different subsets of students? Like it's the, the, the same ideas uh, you know, that would uh, make perfect sense for someone in Europe, uh, are completely meaningless for people in Africa. How can I customize the, uh, the application of the ideas uh, to these different groups? That was great. Uh, planning the entire content and experience uh, itself took me way more than I have taken for any class put together. Just figuring out what goes in which week and how do I chunk it down, uh, how do I make sure I have the right sequence. Uh, we take these things for granted in a physical class. If I've messed up a sequence, you're going to ask me a question. Professor, you didn't cover that. And I answer the question, right? Uh, but you don't have the luxury of any of that in a MOOC. And so uh, the whole notion of adding structure, thinking through uh, interactivity, customization, uh, how do I get students to collaborate with e each other? How do I allow them to self-select the group that they want to be in? Uh, how do I engage them? How do I give them feedback? Uh, these were all things that I had never, ever thought about uh, as an instructor. And, and so uh, this helped a lot, right? Uh, 
also the way we've looked at MOOCs at the University of Toronto is we sort of think about a MOOC course as a course set. It's a six week class. It doesn't replace a uh, on-campus class, uh, but it sort of you know, helps uh, uh, students who are thinking about the topic perhaps get more engaged with the ideas or think about applying for the appropriate degree program. And so uh, that was the other uh, little thing that we wanted to think about. So we did that. The MOOC itself uh, worked wonderfully well. We got a lot of good feedback, which I'm not going to uh, get into. Uh, but the question is, what did we do at the end with all of the insights, with all of the content that we had developed uh, from the MOOC? And so here's the first thing we did, um, was we flipped uh, our classrooms at U of T. Right? Uh, and you know, I'd been reading a lot about the flipped classrooms, and I was always fairly skeptical about the notion uh, and I went in with a healthy dose of skepticism, uh, but then I was converted after two semesters of doing this. Uh, and essentially, the, the way we flipped it was we had a lot of content on videos that now our on-campus degree students could access, uh, gave them fairly directed uh, guidance on which videos to watch. We replaced the textbook with a combination of videos and uh, materials developed for the MOOC, um, gave them fairly directed instructions on how to prepare, and all of our classes were now uh, you know, a, a three-minute lecture saying, you know, hopefully by now you know A, B, C, D, and E, having watched the videos. And then we jump into a case discussion, or we jump into a project, or we jump into problem sets. And so all of the classes essentially became uh, supervised homework sessions or supervised project sessions, if you will. And, and that was fantastic. That worked really well. Um, completely unscientific evidence. But if you compare course evaluations uh, in the pre-flipped and post-flipped days, uh, there is a dramatic difference. But again, I am the first one uh, to say that if I submitted this claim to the journal that I edit, I would reject that claim. Uh, but for, you know, today I get to be the, the practitioner, so I can say that. Uh, so that's one thing we did, right? The other thing uh, that we did was we played around uh, a fair bit with the notion of blending. Right? Um, and we did this not just in our undergraduate classes, but also in one of the projects that I spoke about, the Gates Foundation funded project. This was with secondary school, high school students uh, at, at two independent schools. Uh, in Toronto, uh, randomly assigned into two groups, the blended group and the uh, MOOC only group or the online uh, engagement only group. Uh, we measured three kinds of things uh, in terms of their performance. We looked at achievement, so how well did they do in the scores, did they comprehend the material, that sort of stuff. Uh, we looked at engagement, uh, how much time did they spend on the, on the materials, uh, how many resources did they access, did they you know, participate and ask questions? Uh, did they make use of all of the different kinds of resources that were, that were available? Uh, and then finally, we measured uh, persistence, uh, which is students that hadn't, like, you know, they, that got their quiz questions wrong. Uh, you had the option of either saying, forget it, I'm done, I'm going to move on, or you could go back and retry uh, all the quizzes. And so we sort of, you know, measured how many people actually went back uh, and, and repeated uh, stuff. And essentially what we found was blending worked. Right? A uh, blending actually helped, and I think that kind of goes back to the point you were making at the end, which is uh, there is something about being face to face with a group of people and exchanging ideas and critiquing and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, for, for whatever it's worth, that evidence was, was interesting and important, and I think it, it suggests that there is potential for using MOOCs kind of, or, or MOOC material uh, differently uh, in, our, in our classrooms going forward. So uh, that's the other thing that we uh, spent a fair bit of time on, thinking about flipping, versus, uh, or, or flipping and blending. Uh, and so what I want to do in the last, I guess, two minutes that you're going to give me, or one minute that you're going to give me, uh, is... Uh, talk about my opinions or my thoughts or just a framework to think about uh, how do we most efficiently deliver education? I, I talked about the fact that in India we have uh, constraints, we don't have enough qualified teachers, <coughs> funding is an issue, we go to schools uh, in rural India where in fact uh, you know, they haven't seen a teacher for months. Uh, so how do we deal with situations like that? And, uh, and the model that we are working with in India, and this is in, in partnership with a professor at the Indian Institute of Management, uh, is a simple ABC analysis kind of model. So this is where my engineering roots come in. Uh, always trying to do a Pareto classification, uh, AB 
and C. What is A, B, and C? Uh, C is content only. So if I look at the entire scope of the education, of the course, of the material that I'm going to deliver, uh, what is it that is purely content? The formulas, the, the lectures, the frameworks. Uh, B stands for content for which it would help to have clarification and discussion. And then A uh, would be you know, <coughs> content where interaction is key. This is, you know, this is your project. This is where you apply your learnings into a real world setting. This is where you discuss a case, all, all of those things. And so what we started doing with a lot of educators in India is let's start with your course. Let's do an ABC analysis and figure out what falls into A, what falls into B, what falls into C. Um, and then uh, think about the best way of delivering A, B, and C. Right, so for obviously C, uh, put it on a video or, or put it on uh, you know, um, a website. Uh, B, uh, you could do a Google Hangout kind of an interaction. So you, you, know, you have the material, but there is a live agent, if you will, who can answer questions. And for A, uh, that's where you really need the instructor in the classroom. And so we've started experimenting with different models where uh, students don't show up to school every day. They get two days where they do B and C from home. Uh, and then the third day they show up at school, and that way the instructor flies from school to school, and we can stretch that instructor resource uh, over a period of time. Uh, we've also, uh, you know, applied the idea of, of efficiency in a number of different ways. And so one of the observations that was made to me by a, a school teacher who visited me in Toronto was, uh, he said he went to my son's school and he said, you know what, Dilip, the thing is, uh, every single teacher in your son's school can teach at least ten different things. I think teach 10 different subjects. Uh, what a waste of resources, right? Uh, and so in conjunction with some of the train-the-trainer train the ideas, what, what he's developed is a model where, uh, let's say you're teaching someone math, uh, there is one instructor that knows only how to teach differentiation. That's all this person does. And there's somebody else who knows uh, only how to teach integration, and somebody else who does only logs. And so what you do there is, again, you stretch your resources as you train people to be experts in, in local areas, uh, and that way you can deliver a lot more to the students. Uh, so let me end up by talking about three sort of MOOC myths, uh, and I call them MOOC. By the way, MOOC is unfortunate. It's, it's you know, probably not the best term. It sort of uh, raises the picture of a cow in my head for some reason, um, but we'll stick with it. Um, MOOC myth number one, and this is something that I've read in newspapers a lot and you know, heard some journal articles and so on and so forth, is a, a MOOC is essentially putting a course on video online. And I think that's just wrong. Right? I mean, there are some people that do that, uh, but you can actually go way beyond uh, simply putting stuff on video. So think about ideas of you know, gamification and personalization and, and, and collaboration and uh, you know, uh, identification. And so a lot of things that you can do uh, with a MOOC-like setting uh, that you really can't do in the classroom. Uh, number two, uh, myth number two, people always say that a MOOC is great for the C kind of uh, you know, a classification where it's just putting content online. And again, my experience is no, it's not the case. I mean, we had uh, students that produced amazing projects for the, for the online MOOC that actually governments are using now in parts of Africa and Asia. Right? And so uh, we've actually been able to create a structure where you go beyond simply content and get people to exchange ideas and, and, and build applications. Uh, and three, uh, MOOC will challenge the traditional education models? And I'd say the answer is no. I think what they will do is supplement uh, and augment and enhance the traditional education. So on that note, I will shut up and we'll pass on the time to you. Thank you, Dilip. It's with a lot of pleasure that I will present you un jeune, un relativement jeune professeur à l'Université Concordia, Vivek Venkatesh, euh, qui est euh, Associate Dean of Academic Programs and Development at the School of Graduate Studies and Associate Professor in the Educational Technology Graduate Program at Concordia. His research draws on internationally established collaborations and takes an interdisciplinary approach to systematically uncovering the cognitive, sociological, and psychological factors that influence interactions in niche communities of both the online and offline variety. Vivek and his team have published in the fields of information, science, social psychology, marketing, educational psychology, and technology integration. 
He is the lead editor for the recently released collection, Educational, Psychological, and Behavioral Considerations in Niche Online Communities, published, published by IGI Worldwide. And he was also guest editor for the January 2014 special issue on the impact of Web 2.0 technologies in higher education. This was for the International Journal of Technologies in Higher Education. But if you want to know the other side of Vivek, I invite you to grab a copy of the uh, Metro, the, uh, you know, the newspaper, the distribute in the tube or the, <laughs> or the subway. Page 26, you'll see another side of Vivek. I'll, I'll leave you with that, but <laughs> please grab a copy. It's worth it. Merci Fernand. Euh, tout d'abord, vraiment, je voudrais euh, remercier Fernand pour l'invitation. Euh, quand il m'a posé cette question à, à San Diego euh, l'année passée, il m'a dit, écoute, j'organise un panel. Euh, C'est à McGill, peux-tu venir euh, parler de, de ta recherche? J'ai dit, ben, bien sûr, as most of my colleagues and students know, uh, uh, I own the podium. So <laughs> I'm able to talk at will for it for great lengths of time with respect to my research. Uh, but uh, when I found out that it was for the, uh, for the annual uh, conference of the Federation, I was even more honored to be, uh, to be part of this, uh, this illustrious group. And uh, I thank you for being here. Um, Speaking at the end of, uh, of, such a, uh, um, of such an interesting panel and uh, with people who have uh, very strong opinions uh, surrounding their use of open online education, myself included, is, is really good. Um, and uh, I was very glad that, uh, that, uh, that our president, uh, Professor Mayoni, asked us to uh, brasser la cage un peu. And uh, I think we're doing that. And I will continue to do so. C'est vous qui vous avez dit ça, brasser la cage. Excusez-moi, Madame Fortier. <laughs> Alors, euh, je vais chercher le... Voilà. I'd like to begin by, uh, by putting up a quote from about 98 years ago. Uh, and this is John Dewey, a famous American philosopher, uh, who said, if we teach today as we taught yesterday, we rob our children of tomorrow. And this is something that I've, I've been thinking about very carefully uh, in, my, in my career as, uh, as someone who's worked in education, but who's come from a field uh, like Dilip uh, that's focused in the physical sciences. My first degree was in computer science, uh, and uh, uh, I developed uh, some competencies in teaching because uh, that's how I made, uh, that's how I was able to buy uh, music when I was, uh, when I was a young uh, high school student. I gave tuition, private tuitions. Um, but what I'd like to reflect on very quickly before I move to, to some assertions, um, and I hope they're they're, uh, they're, uh, they're controversial enough for you to be thinking about, uh, is, uh, is how we can actually test this particular, uh, this particular saying, uh, it, given, given what we're experiencing, uh, especially in the Canadian online uh, higher education systems. Uh, I'll present you some variables. I've conducted a fair amount of research looking at motivational and attitudinal variables. So I actually disagree with, uh, with Dilip when he says that uh, we, should, uh, we shouldn't be looking at unscientific evidence like course evaluations. In fact, when you look at uh, various second order meta-analyses of how teaching evaluations can be predictors of good uh, course effectiveness, uh, the correlations are fairly high. And these are correlations that are dealing with very large numbers uh, of students. In fact, we've got uh, evidence from the Open University, uh, which people might have forgotten is one of the purveyors of uh, open online education in the UK, with over a million, sometimes a million and a half pieces of data that point towards teaching effectiveness as predictors of course effectiveness. And there are a number of administrators in this room. Um, we often use teaching effectiveness as a reason to promote hire, fire people in our uh, universities. So we should be very careful about looking at course evaluations and questions that ask students and teachers to, uh, to, uh, to uh, measure attitudes as they relate to a student's learning experiences. Uh, I've conducted a study most recently with a colleague at the uh, University du Québec à Montréal, Magda Fusaro, and we published the results a couple of years ago, and it was uh, in relation to, uh, to perceptions of course effectiveness by 15,000 students in Quebec and 2,500 professors. Uh, these were across 12 Quebec universities. And what we found uh, was, first of all, that instructors are content creators, at least they're perceived as content creators, both in the minds of the students as well as the instructors themselves. And they're using social media and Web 2.0 tools 
in way more creative ways than students are. Uh, students are content consumers, right? They're happy to read an instructor's blog. They're happy if an instructor takes the initiative in creating content for a, uh, an instructional system, but very rarely do they wish to contribute, right? So my, I'm choosing my words carefully. They wish to contribute. They're not, I'm not measuring how much they've contributed. Uh, and what we found was a huge disconnect, which goes back to the title of my presentation, Connecting with the Disconnect. A huge disconnect in the way the instructors and students perceive course effectiveness. Uh, instructors, in fact, want more collaborative activities in classrooms, and that reflects very well the kinds of designs that we're imposing, whether it's in face-to-face -face classrooms or it's in the design of online education, open, massive, or otherwise. Uh, and I will come back to that issue of size, because size does matter to me, but you'll be surprised at how small I like my sizes. Um, the, the other thing that you need to be very careful about is that a number of studies are now pointing to students wanting that sage on a stage, right? They want the instructor to be the deliverer of content. And it's easy to criticize students and say, well, they're lazy, right? They just want to sit back and they don't want to read. They just want me to regurgitate what's in the textbook. But that may not be the case because when you look at students' browsing habits, when you look at their content creation habits in environments that are not specific to online learning for social purposes, then you see that they're creating content, sharing content, and they're in fact learning in very different ways. And so that's the basis of, of the talk that I'd like to give today. Uh, my, my consideration is that size does matter, but let's stop talking about massive and let's talk about niche. Let's talk about small communities, online communities or otherwise, that have in fact been debating, arguing, rationalizing, and logically and sometimes illogically making assertions about current social topics. So a number of things that we've been looking at in our, in our interdisciplinary research teams focus on how the future is, in fact, niche. The future is niche because without understanding how niche online communities operate, how communities that have been existed for more than 20 years, uh, and how these data points of, uh, of, uh, of utterances, of phrases, uh, that, are being, uh, that are being exchanged amongst online uh, communities, how they can in fact help us design better learning environments. One of the things that I've worked with uh, is the notion of technocracy, which uh, was introduced to me by uh, a colleague of mine, David Waddington. Um, and he's a, he's a scholar of John Dewey, and he's spoken a lot about how technocracy uh, in fact trumps democracy in a number of online environments. And we've noticed this happens more and more often. The more tyrannical your forum moderator is, the better the discussions are on your forums. Now imagine telling a teaching assistant or even a professor to lay down the law in an online forum. That's probably not going to happen. Unless, of course, you start anonymizing identities. Right? So what I'm trying to do in some of my research is create six or eight weeks of a course, let's say half an online course, where students don't know which student they're interacting with, right? And they're able to then bring about a more technocratic way of regulating discussions in a forum. I mean, listen, we haven't heard about the Italian political disaster since the technocrat economist was, was put into power, right? So Berlusconi is sort of a twinkle in our eye now. And technocracy has worked outside of the education system. Let's think of how it works for education. Cognitions differ. Uh, I'm doing work now uh, with, with behavioral neuroscientists, uh, eye tracking measures, gaze behaviors in online environments. Cognitions differ in online environments as opposed to face-to-face -face interactions and textual reading. Why are we not taking into account how these cognitions differ in designing online environments? There's a big tension in the rhetorics. I've been trying to figure out two questions here, but instead of asking what can online learning do for us, we should probably ask what is online learning, right? And we should stop thinking about how we can apply principles that work in face-to-face -face situations, such as this, uh, uh, this live stream, uh, which may or may not be useful to, uh, to, uh, to, to people who are watching it, uh, and try and stop replicating what works in face-to-face -face situations in online environments. Let's look at how these niche communities are interacting. Uh, and I'll come to some, uh, some, uh, some, some ideas. And, you know, some of the vapid and, and feckless edutainment that is being promoted in online learning uh, is, uh, it, it's rather disastrous to see. Now, 
when I was uh, when I was training to be a computer scientist, I was asked to take one of the first online learning courses. Uh, this was in the late 90s that uh, that had been accredited, and this was done via Cisco, uh, Network Management Specialist course. So it took about four weeks for me to go through what at that time was known as learning objects. Um, I know that that paradigm seems to have sort of fizzled out and become molten lava and has already been buried, but I'd question whether we're in fact uh, away from that paradigm at all, whether we're still in fact experimenting with that learning object paradigm in building our open online courses and education systems. So let's move away from thinking of entertainment as education and keeping things benign because we need to be able to engage our students in much better ways and take into account how they're using social media and Web 2.0 tools. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to incorporate it immediately into our, into our courses. Right? So I'm not saying build a Facebook page for your, for your course uh, or, uh, or get a Twitter feed running in your course, but there are some really interesting uh, ideas that we're working on at Concordia that I can share with you uh, later on at our, uh, during our Q&A. So some of the things to keep in mind as we're moving forward, uh, the notion of time is very, very important to consider. Uh, creating a 13-week uh, online course does not give you the same learning outcomes, doesn't give you the same instructional outcomes necessarily as a 13-week uh, face-to-face classroom. And the MOOCs have really done a great job of allowing students to enter at will, begin their, uh, pace their instructional uh, uh, strategies over an extended period of time and complete at will. Uh, and that's something that we can take away from, uh, from these open online education uh, uh, philosophies. We need to do a better job of scaffolding relationships. Uh, we talk a lot about learner-learner, learner-teacher, and in 2004, um, a Canadian scholar, Terry Anderson, spoke about content-content interactions. Where is that? Where are we seeing that? We're seeing that more and more in social media. One of the problems we have as digital uh, immigrants, I guess, would be that we tend to personify technologies, and we tend to look at technologies as human essence, right? So we talk about how my phone isn't working, I hate my phone, really? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I hate Apple, I only work with IBM, really? Right, really, you really hate a technology? And I think that one of the things you want to keep in mind as you're, as you're uh, thinking of these relationships and scaffolding relationships that are content to content oriented is remove the, the creator of that, of that piece of information away from your analysis and think of the information existing as being rather castrated. How can you then impose a certain context to that information and use it as a teaching and learning tool? Another notion to think about would be technological transparency. You know, the, the, the forums and the, and the wikis that I've analyzed in a lot of my research are those that are fairly technologically transparent. Uh, this is another Deweyan term. Um, and he really is a, a, a wonderful thinker because he's come up with all this 80, 90 years before we're actually beginning to imagine how they influence our own, uh, uh, our own uh, debates. Uh, but when you look at wikis and forums, these allow the users to in fact um, create and to, to be as free as possible in expressing their identities, right? So you can choose a, uh, uh, you, you're free to choose whatever name you'd like for yourself and anonymize yourself. You can choose an avatar if you'd like. Uh, there's no uh, limits to how, how large or how small your posts need to be. Uh, and there's also the, uh, the, uh, the, the extreme pleasure that one has of analyzing data from a longitudinal perspective. Try and do this in Facebook and Twitter, and you'll notice that the technology is very opaque. Right? There are a number of rules and regulations that need to be adhered to as you're building environments to allow people to interact. So if you're thinking of learning environments, which is one step beyond just a social environment, you'd better be using something that's technologically transparent. So I say let's go back to, to forums, let's go back to the DOS age uh, and build conversations around this blinking yellow light, you know? Some of you might remember that. Uh, and you know, digital nomads are, no, are, are, are I think, something that we should, we should co-opt in our conversation. Uh, people's online identities don't necessarily reflect their, uh, their daily life, right? And so how do you, in fact, allow a person to transpose themselves between an online life and a, 
uh, and a uh, and a, uh, a real life, so to speak, virtual versus real. Uh, a number of virtual reality-based research is particularly interesting as well to draw upon as we're thinking of moving beyond uh, MOOCs. So just very briefly, these talking points would be perhaps something that we could, uh, we could discuss later on. I brought up the Sage on a Stage paradigm, uh, how we need to move beyond reactive instructional design, uh, and we need to be much more proactive in building learning environments that uh, are meeting our learners' needs. And it's surprising how we don't seem to, to, uh, to inform ourselves with their behaviors in online environments without the, uh, the, uh, the learning environments themselves, without the online learning environments that we're trying to uh, press them into. So again, think of within and without, right? That's something that George Harrison said very well in Sergeant Pepper's uh, uh, and I'd, I'd urge you to, uh, to contact a colleague of mine who's, uh, who's influenced my thinking. Uh, he's from University of Alberta, teaches in the Department of Secondary Education, and uh, specialist in public pedagogy. And he and I uh, have co-edited a book together, and this is something I pulled out with his permission. Uh, so uh, I think that we have to continue now, like Jason says, to, to seek ways to affirm both the experimental and the positive potential of online spaces, especially, and we haven't heard this very much from the panel, but it's probably something we could debate, amidst the threat of their increasing corporate enclosure and delimitation. Think Sebastian Thrun, think what happened to Udacity. All right, and let's have some frank and honest conversations about how recruitment and retention are the big variables that we are considering in developing MOOCs. They certainly are to me. It's not about learning and teaching, it's recruitment and retention. Thanks very much. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you for the three presenters. That was very interesting. Now it's time, we, we have time for, uh, to be engaged in the conversation. So uh, it's time to ask questions, to interact with our presenters. But uh, if you don't mind using the microphones uh, on the right and left side, because it's videotaped, so uh, we won't be able to hear you on the, on the rewind business thing. Questions, comments? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I guess I have a comment uh, as well as a question. Uh, the comment for Vivek and the question for both my fellow panel members who know more about this stuff than I do. Uh, and the comment had to do with your observation about, uh, you know, thinking about massive and niche as two separate animals. And I think at some level they're the same thing. I think niches follow from being massive. Uh, if you think about online commerce, for example, right, the ability of uh, you know, the whole notion of cutting down transaction costs, of cutting down uh, you know, the, the cost of, of engaging with customers and so on and so forth has allowed customers to express their preferences in a more different way. We've seen long tails emerge, and I think the same is true potentially in education. So if you have a massive uh, approach to, to creating content and distributing it, uh, it itself, I think, will create the uh, emergence of niches. So that's just a quick comment, and, and I don't know if you uh, want to think about that as well. But uh, here's, here's the question, and the question has to do with teaching evaluations. And, and I think, uh, yeah, let me just also clarify that I wasn't saying that teaching evaluations aren't useful, uh, they are great, uh, but it was the, really the before and after thing without controlling for anything else that I was commenting on. But to your classification of teaching as an art versus teaching as a science, I think most of our teaching evaluation instruments tend to evaluate instructors as artists and not so much as scientists. And I was wondering if that, if you shared that observation, if you had any thoughts on that, because I mean, I've seen some, some instruments that we use at U of T, uh, but they all value the instructor as an artist. I don't know. Thank you, uh, Dilip. Yes, uh, I certainly think that, um, that massive uh, and niche can be seen on a spectrum, and I completely agree with you. Uh, but my use of, uh, of, uh, of massive and niche as opposite ends of a spectrum was, was of course, rhetoric. I, I'm trying to make a point that uh, we seem to focus a lot on, the, uh, on the, uh, the recruitment potential, on the thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people and now it's millions, it's now in the millions from what I understand, 
and massive open online courses. Uh, whereas what's happening in those, in those courses, in fact, are the niche communal discussions. Uh, as you pointed out, some of those uh, flipped classroom ideas are, are, I think, perfectly relevant for better understanding how different groups of people create systems whereby they're collaborating and, uh, and hopefully attaining certain instructional objectives. So your point is, is absolutely right. Um, and to your question about teaching as an art versus teaching as scientists, yes, uh, I come from an institution where we discuss uh, very, uh, in very transparent ways how we can better reflect the, uh, the, the, the items in our teaching evaluations uh, to, uh, to, to represent the, the enormous tasks uh, and components of, uh, of, of, of teaching, right, in a face-to-face in a -face or in a blended environment. Uh, more and more, I find that we're moving away from <coughs> principles of educational psychology and, uh, and motivation uh, and motivation theory uh, to better create these representations. So what I'm trying to do in my research, in fact, is base the, the uh, revisions to any teaching evaluation or perceptions of course effectiveness uh, uh, instrument on um, the most up-to-date uh, empirical research in the topic. Uh, I'm not uh, someone who denies his post-positivist uh, orientation, uh, but I certainly think that our, that, our, uh, that our quest for empirical data has led us to ignore how, uh, how the humanities and how the letters, in fact, can influence the way we think about teaching and learning. So uh, I certainly think that it's a, it's a complex equation, uh, unlike a lot of other, perhaps, physical sciences. Uh, we, we do not engage in enough interdisciplinary practices to better understand teaching and learning. So uh, we, we need to move forward more on that. But as you can see, we're, we're both yeah. passionate about the same issue. Yeah. Well, on the idea of massive and, and evaluation, um, I think it's extremely deceptive at this point because those who complete, it's a small fraction of those who went online. And uh, it depends what you want to put in the evaluation. Uh, and I think people are moving away right now from uh, how many will, will get credits for mm -hmm. it or whatever. Uh, just the very fact, uh, edX is a good example of that. And Harvard just revised yeah. its criteria about that, that it's a good idea to have it so some students will come. And the research is pretty clear saying that those who complete are mainly those who already have a degree. So it's not massive in the sense, let's go and offer that to the world. It's not how it's happening. Because it, it is a social process. How you get in there, how you know about it, how you get support for that. So I think we are just at the very beginning of what we will need in terms of evaluation criteria for that. And uh, us, we haven't talked about the, the whole new field of learning analytics, who will help us progressively get there. So. Well, one question I would have as a moderator, how do you, and please, it's not a political debate, <laughs> how do you tackle the uh, issue of language uh, with massive uh, dissemination of uh, courses like that? Good question, yeah. Yeah, France is trying to do something on the francophone side for that. Uh, there's a, people are getting organized slowly around it. Um, you know, you speak your native language, so probably part of your course relates to yeah. people. And right now, academics are so well spread around the world that it's one academic you talk about colleagues in India, mm -hmm. you know. So people, local people are extremely important. They may be people who graduated with you. The idea is to keep the network going after graduation. Absolutely. So one way in which we tackle this, actually, in the, in the MOOC that I taught was we crowdsourced content, uh, a translation in particular. Um, so we had this little competition where uh, you could take the content, translate that into Hindi or Chinese or Swahili or whatever else. Three people judged your translation. Uh, and very quickly, we had, yeah, we, we had the course in like 27 different languages. Uh, and that was amazing to me. And because, you know, there's, there's people out there who are willing to to do that. And so to the extent you can harness the power of the collective in, in doing that, I think it's, it's fairly easy to do. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's not just a language issue. It's also disability and access more generally. So you know, making sure that 
uh, people who are accessing the course on a, on a phone who can't see the image can at least see a description of the image. So there's a lot of those things to think about uh, that, again, I would never think about when I taught a offline class. So this has all been an interesting, uh, interesting experience. Would like to comment, Vivek? Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, the, the question is very pertinent, especially when we seem to have, uh, have taken this learning object paradigm and buried it. Uh, in fact, the, the whole notion of creating learning objects and, uh, and creating metadata for learning objects was in fact to be able to, to, uh, to move these, uh, uh, these pieces of information across a mul multiple contexts. Uh, I've in fact worked on the development of a technology we call Topic Maps. It's an uh, open source technology. It's, uh, it's available freely via, the, via ISO. And the first, the first example of us using this technology was in fact to uh, uh, transmit information amongst the Scandinavian nations around uh, the use of, yeah. of uh, information science technologies. So we had a topic map. You could choose to see it, view it in Finnish, in Swedish, in Norwegian, uh, in Icelandic, and uh, uh, and it uh, it uh, it created uh, it it had translated information. And uh, as Dilip pointed out, with crowdsourcing now, a lot of the analyses that I conduct on forums, uh, I use Google Translate, and then I verify the translation with native speakers. Uh, in the forums who are more than willing to help me figure out the nuances. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it is good to use the, uh, the expertise within the domain itself. Yeah. Wonderful. Question? Bernard, I wanted just tell you that we have a microphone now. We have a mic, uh, roving mic, so if any of you have questions, you can just raise ah, your hands. Um, great. I just want to abuse my privilege uh, and ask a question. Um, uh, Madame Laferriere, when we talked about La salle de cours avec sa dimension sociale. J'aimais beaucoup ce, cette idée, ce concept. Quoique maintenant, je vois avec mes étudiants, tout le monde derrière leur écran. Je ne sais pas si on a encore cette dimension sociale qu'on avait. Dans, je ne sais pas. I'm not sure what the social dimension is. I mean, I try to create it. But, but speaking of the idea of a social dimension in a classroom, do MOOCs need to have a classroom? as part of that teaching environment? Or are MOOCs completely out there, uh, online, in cyberspace? So what I'm saying is, does the artist or the professor have to be rooted mm -hmm. on a stage or in an, an arena with real live uh, attendees? Or is it a completely other dimension? Yeah. That's right. You know, I've never taught an online course, and I will never do it. <laughs> that's, that's a personal choice. You know, I want a blended environment. Every course I've been teaching over the past 15 years, there has been an electronic forum. So this online dimension is part of it. One of the best um, effects, I would say, or impacts of using that is that you enhance the interaction in the classroom because online you can do it in a different way. So it's extremely important, this online dimension, but the on-site is extremely important for me. And uh, during my course, the students bring their computer, but there is an activity there that makes it uh, relevant, okay? They, they have to do something. But I'm not talking here about a large classroom because I think that if it is a one-way communication, this can go online. And it, it's the flip approach, that sort of thing. But the idea is that, well, Educom has been talking for years about the studio approach, you know. It has to be, and we, all the three of us have talked about that. It's the direct interaction with the students. It's to help understand better an issue, a problem. You're face-to-face -face for complex problems, you know, and discussing that. And uh, to learn, you need prior Learning, you know, it's, that's, you know, prior knowledge is important and part of that can be done online. And it's the, it's the mix of both. So the, the MOOC I taught was completely, as you said, out there. There was, you know, there was, there was obviously a little bit of lecturing that happened as short five minute videos embedded within the content. Uh, but I guess it also depends on how you, you know, think about the goals of your MOOC and, and, and the complexity of the information that you're trying to convey. So in my case, I was trying to 
sell, if you will, maybe sell is not, not, not the right word, but uh, I was trying to expose people to a new way of thinking about behavior change. It was sort of a, here's an idea that you should think about, here's an approach you should think about, as opposed to getting them to do you know, complex optimization problems. And so uh, given that my goals were relatively modest at the end of the six weeks, I wanted my students to say, ha, huh, you know what? I'd never thought of it that way. Uh, I think being out there on its own was fine. But if I had, if my goals were a bit more ambitious, if, if I had, you know, I wanted them to not just do that and think about an application, but I wanted to help them, you know, develop a model of economic behavior, then I think, I, you know, the, that blended approach would have been the optimal choice. So, uh, so that's one thinking. The, the other thinking is also from the point of view of the university. I mean, why are we doing MOOCs? And I think one of the reasons why, uh, why I think we're doing MOOCs is to get more students or more potential students interested in doing a degree. Uh, and from that, exactly. So it, I see the MOOC as a funnel. I mean, you, you, know, you see new ideas, you can uh, get more people engaged, interested, and hopefully they will show up in your classroom eventually. So. Nadia Bazara, Université d'Ottawa, membre de la Fédération, representative for associations on the board. I have a question about video. So, for example, Vivek, you spoke about um, you know, professors as content creators, students as content consumers. So, working around video, and I'm thinking, for example, the Open University and, and bringing so many people in through television, how, you know, should professors consider, seriously consider developing some good video skills, or should they, for instance, encourage their students, many of whom develop those video skills? My two and a half year old knows my iPhone very well, it's very scary. So by the time she's 21, I'm quite worried of what she'll be doing. So, you know, should we encourage our students, not, not confining them to say, you must create a video, but at least saying one of the outcomes you know, one of the things you might produce in this course might be video. So, who, where, where does the responsibility lie for video, for instance? Yeah, that's a, that's a very pertinent question. Thanks for that. Uh, I guess I can approach it from, from, from two, two perspectives. One is that, uh, from a personal standpoint at Concordia, we've been, uh, we've been experimenting with some lecture capture technologies, which are I believe slowly uh, going to be rolled out uh, for our uh, for our instructors to be able to use, uh, and we we would expect that those those lectures would then uh, be stored in an online repository and be available for students to be able to view either after class for review or perhaps even used for uh, recruitment purposes, as you pointed out. Uh, one of the things that video helps us work with, and I have to t bring this back to the notion of perceptions, right, is. Um, it helps create a perception that you are in a classroom. And there is a certain emotional and motivational element to that, especially for, for uh, I'm, I'm thinking of someone like myself who's experienced most of his learning in, uh, in socialized uh, socialized face-to-face -face contexts. Uh, so I think that there is, there is an element of motivation that comes into play in the learner's mind, uh, but what can really help those, uh, those lectures or kill those lectures is the charisma of the, of the professor. Uh, and uh, and there's, there, there aren't too many ways in which you can, you can develop that very quickly. What we're trying to do in our, um, uh, in our university context is build more self-awareness uh, and reflection capabilities in professors by videotaping their lectures. So the idea is not to tell them, we're gonna tape this so that you can put it online, it's to help them build uh, a skill towards self-awareness and reflection, which hopefully, for me, it taught me how impatient I was in class. <laughs> uh, and it's horrifying to see yourself teach uh, a three-hour lecture and then a two-hour lab after, uh, and noticing the, uh, first of all, the mistakes that one makes in teaching multivariate statistics. Uh, which can be numerous, <laughs> and the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the impatience that I demonstrated with uh, with some of the students, which was reflected then in the course evaluations, ergo course evaluations, teaching effectiveness, and learning. So, uh, I, I'm sorry to have to sort of take a circuitous route in answering your question because I think that it's uh, it's a fairly loaded question, and we need to we need to study it from the perspective of both the learner and the instructor. Would you so, like to come? Uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, so I actually did a little bit of 
empirical research to, to kind of compare the two formats of delivering video in a MOOC setting. So do I take a video of uh, the instructor in the classroom uh, and, and then use that uh, in a MOOC setting, or do I create a separate video clearly done in a studio with no other students? Uh, and interestingly, I found the opposite of what I think he was saying, is that if I see a classroom engagement going on and I'm not in the classroom, I find that the student is more likely to be disengaged. Right? Uh, and so actually, one of the skills that I sort of you know, had to develop is, is, is firstly chunking down. So how can I make sure that I don't lose student interest? So a thumb rule number one, no video is more than six minutes. Right? Because that's when students lose their span of interest. So you break down ideas, six minute ideas. Uh, but number two, uh, you know, make it as if they're not watching me interact with some other people because once that happens, then you know, they're disengaged. So we, that was the little thing we did. And so we, that's the principle we, we kept using uh, throughout. Uh, and in terms of the, the responsibility for the students working on videos, I think that's actually a great idea. So uh, you know, we had, uh, our, as part of the final project, they had to produce either a video or a PowerPoint deck or you know, an audio clip. And they were fantastic. And, so, um, and again, you can you know, use that as a basis for ongoing material development as well. So just my experience on that. One trend is certainly um, the reduction of repetition yeah. with digital technologies. And let's think about word processing. It has reduced the repetition. I remember how I did my doctoral dissertation. You know. So we came a long way with that. And it's about the same thing. You know. One thing I found is that using digital technologies, it reduces the repetition. So that's one way to go about it. And I agree that it should be almost just in case, huh? or just in time, but, but yeah, one idea. when they need the information. Yeah. I, I do have one comment to make uh, with regards to this. Uh, the, the notion of chunking, the notion of making bite-sized pieces, I think that, uh, that it's a cop-out. And I think that we, we do way too much, okay. way too much in taking our, our, our instructional practices that have worked in face-to-face -face situations, that have worked in, in distance education, um, uh, especially the ones that, were, that dealt with text, and try and impose those on online education. Look at how our, our digital natives, our, our youth, our, uh, our undergraduate and graduate students are able to concentrate for hours at a stretch in online environments for which they're uh, using, they're using it either for social purposes, for information retrieval, they're not chunking themselves, right? So what's occurring naturally, we're trying to, to break down into component pieces. And I think that goes back to some of the work that I saw in the development of courses, like in the Cisco course that I took um, almost two de decades ago, everything is about chunking, but very little was about sequencing. Right, so Dilip brought that up very well in his MOOC. He talked about sequencing as being a key, key issue. So I'd actually urge you to move away from this notion of chunking, and this is coming from an educational psychologist. So, well, um, we could debate that. <laughs> of course, we could. Yeah. Quick comment. Quick comment, Dilip. I, I was so, just going to say uh, my yeah. approach is to be empirical yeah. about it. I mean, you try different things, yeah. see what works, and uh, yeah. that's what you use. And that's you know, I'm a social scientist. That's what I do. I do experiments. Uh, this worked in this case, but you're right. I mean, I, I can see it differ as a function of complexity of information again, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's the more narrative you are in, in the kind of information you're conveying, the easier it is to use longer pieces. So, I mean, yeah, empirical question. Merci. Question? Comment? Patricia Albanese, uh, president of the Canadian Sociological Association at Ryerson University. Um, I couldn't help but notice that Dilip uh, used the, the notion or the idea of uh, delivering efficiently. And I'm wondering why we should see efficiency as a goal in what we're doing. And related to that, we've seen a lot of continuums today. And I'm wondering, is this about delivering knowledge more democratically and uh, education more democratically or more uh, neoliberally? Thanks. So I'll make a quick comment on the efficiency thing. And I, you know, I, m maybe it's not a pressing need today in Canada to be efficient, but I think it will be. Uh, because every time you come to a forum like this, you know, the b big issues we hear are, well, we don't have enough 
resources, we don't have enough money, we have a shortage of instructors, and I, I think that problem is gonna grow over time. Uh, so efficiency to me is, is part of it, is how can we best use our resources uh, in, in, uh, you know, and stretch them as much as we can, but also in terms of within the context of a class, uh, how can we best deliver a meaningful educational experience with the resource of instructor time or, or you know, uh, whatever else is available to them. I think as instructors, most of us tend to spend a lot of time on things we really shouldn't be spending time on, and these might include things like designing quizzes or uh, you know, grading papers and so on and so forth. And so to the extent we can embed efficiency into that and put our, our, our time into more value-added stuff, I think that's where I was going to with that. Uh, the continuum stuff, I'm gonna leave it to, uh, to my two colleagues to explain. You know, with the new technologies, we, citizenship is changing. And uh, there is this concept in education uh, called the hidden curriculum. So what are we doing when we are teaching? What's the underneath curriculum? So if we want citizens that are in full power, given all the information, we almost live at the age of chaos right now in terms of the information. So for me, this is one way to complete the student's experience with something else than delivery. So in order to get time, somehow we need to be a bit more efficient when we deliver. And I've heard so many students saying, okay, when I'm quiet and I'm listening to this video, I can stop. So some students can do it like that. And I mentioned repetition. There are many things we can just stop doing over and over and do something else when we have the students. And I certainly agree that we, move, we have to move more toward the democratic route. For citizenship, and I come back to this notion of complex problem and collaborative learning and collaborative work. You know, I've heard often people saying, okay, we hired the undergrads, they have the same degree, same performance, we are going to keep those who can collaborate, who can share the knowledge. So it's where we are moving now. And the technology is the affordance for that, but it also, it has helped create that new problem for us, so. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to just uh, uh, pick up on, uh, on Therese's uh, point. Uh, I've been introduced to, uh, to a notion of citizen education called radical democracy uh, fairly recently. I come to the, the game fairly late, but the whole notion of, of radical democracy and its components like agonism and agonistic pluralism encourages our students to take perspectives of others, which is something that we see happening often in online forums, and not necessarily in efficient ways. So to, to speak to your point about efficiency, I think that uh, using that as a metric could actually pose problems in terms of looking at learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, very often, you need to go through a, uh, what my colleague Manu Kapoor from, uh, from National University of Singapore calls productive failure. Mm -hmm. You've actually got to, got to fail, and you've got to fail fairly, spectacularly, before you can actually move into complex problem solving. So we're not talking about failing at, at, at the elementary level at simple or declarative knowledge as much as we're looking at understanding components of larger problems. Radical democracy and productive failure can work hand in hand because they, they allow you to take perspectives of others, to agree to disagree, which we think we do, but we don't do that very often, right? right? We tend to, we tend to uh, attach ourselves to our, to our opinions. Ergo, the, the point I made earlier about taking content that's in online forums and separating the person who made the comment, uh, separating the context in which, was, in which it was made, and embedding that into learning situations. So I think efficiency is a, is a metric that needs to be better played out. Um, the, one of the recent issues of Educational Researcher, which is a flagship journal in our, in our field, in, in the field of education, spoke about how we can use different, uh, different aspects of MOOCs uh, for analytical purposes and promoting different units of analyses, uh, ranging from web clicks, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to eye-gazing behavior. I think that's, uh, that's one step forward, uh, but we, we perhaps, need to, uh, perhaps need to move away from using the actual learning outcome or using tests as a unit of analysis uh, and uh, look at the component parts. Again, it's easy to say these things. It's very difficult to do them. Right. Merci. Bonjour, mon nom c'est Patrick Raffard de l'Université d'Ottawa, and I'm the representative of the Canadian Political Science Association. 
My question is about getting from here to there and about sort of how we manage all of this. What we've heard so far is a brave new world. It's not quite sure where the end point looks like. There may be several end points. But what I'm struck is the disconnect between where we are now and where we could go. So a couple of examples. We teach the way we were taught, and that often means a very conservative traditional way of teaching. When we adopt technology, we do it badly. Uh, the number of really bad PowerPoint presentations that happen every day on a university campus is quite dramatic. dramatic. And second, well, and second, we are given tools and we use them more or less well. So our universities invest in Blackboard and other, tech, and other platforms and we use them very badly. Or we only use a fraction of what's available. So I'm interested if, if you could comment on, given that reality, and given the cool stuff we could go to, both in terms of the technology but also in terms of teaching and the way we teach, how we create the incentives to go from where we are to where we could go, knowing that so far we're very, very conservative and very bad at making change. One step at a time. One step at a So at first it meant distance learning, distance education. We did that. Now we move to MOOCs. So it gets a bit more collaborative. So we see beyond MOOCs, what we come out from today, you know, what will be the next step. I agree that technology you know, has to be at the basis. You know, it has to be stable. It has to be fast. Uh, but often, the technology, with many technologies, the ceiling is very low. And uh, it's not very expensive. And the learning management systems, well, it's there. It has been there. And uh, for a long time, professors, you know, we have the technology people support, and the learning management system were good for that. But if you look at often the pedagogy behind it, well, it's, it's under use. And right now, it is. We have time for okay. one more question. Hello, bonjour. I'm Gail McDonald, back here. <laughs> Bad leg, that's why I'm not standing up. I'm Assistant Vice President of Research at St. Thomas University and its representative, and I'm also on the board of the Federation. I, I wanted to thank you all, it's an amazing presentation. And Dilip, if you can find a way to avoid grading, you will get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> the comments that you made at the very end, Vivek, has, have got me thinking because I am an administrator and I also occasionally teach, and that is, how do MOOCs, we have a problem at universities with recruitment and retention. We don't necessarily, I, I would argue, have a problem of learning. But we love to talk about learning because that's what we love to do. However, and that's what I love to do too, rather than talk about recruitment and retention, which sounds like a boring managerial problem. How do we allow MOOCs to do both? You had made a remark about their design for recruitment and retention. And I'm thinking, as Dilip does, that's not a bad idea. However, how do we do, how do we draw them in, keep them there, and teach them using the MOOC? Uh, thanks, Gil. That's a very pertinent comment. And uh, you're right. It's, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to attempt to point out all the factors that could impact uh, the, the future of how MOOCs might be able to accomplish both the learning outcome uh, goals as well as the recruitment and retention goals. I, the way I see it is uh, I'm noticing that history is repeating itself, especially with respect to the learning <coughs> management systems and learning object repository uh, paradigm. Uh, what's happened with Udacity, which was one of the first uh, MOOCs, uh, MOOC companies that was established is that now it's partnering with corporate organizations and it's, uh, this is fairly recent news, but it's going to, it's partnering with corporate organizations to organize training programs where, uh, much to my chagrin, chunking is the order of the day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what, what I think we're going to see there, uh, in fact, are how, uh, the, how training programs that speak to perhaps uh, much less complex uh, instructional objectives than you might find in a, in a three, six credit undergrad or graduate course, how those intend to, how, how those MOOCs help achieve some of those learning outcomes. Uh, we saw that happen with the learning object paradigm. It happened with Cisco, with IBM, 
Um, I, I teach in a program which is called Educational Technology. The majority of our master's students do internships in large organizations, training organizations, and they're all still deeply embedded in the learning management system and learning object repository paradigm, which is, which is why I think that uh, it's working in the instructional and training world, but we don't exactly know how it's working or it might work for us in the, in the, in the university system. Uh, you know, the, the conjecture I would make is that perhaps we're, we're trying to impose these, uh, uh, these fairly uh, delimited and um, uh, frameworks surrounding instruction that are more applicable perhaps to declarative and procedural knowledge development and not to higher order thinking skills. Right. I think we need to now look at how forums uh, deliberations in forums, and how face-to-face -face participation with, with an expert, whether that's your teacher, whether that's your teaching assistant, uh, or whether you can use communities of practice uh, and communities of knowledge, as Therese pointed out, to help build some of the higher order thinking skills. Um, so, you know, I, I come back often to my students and say, I'd like you to debate this before you leave class. The plural of anecdote is data or is not data. Right? How, to what extent does evidence from multiple, multiple uh, contexts and multiple situations lead us to, uh, to, to implement a data-based or an evidence-based decision? Uh, where's your systematic framework to actually investigate what question you had in mind, what data you collected to answer that question? Uh, we, we need to move beyond the case study approach and the articles that we hear about individual cases working. Uh, and figure out exactly uh, what, what, what that points to in terms of theories of learning. Uh, my conjecture, and I made this again uh, in my presentation today, is that we think differently in online environments. Our cognitions are different. We're finding that in our research, especially the one that I'm conducting with, uh, with neuroscientists, that uh, different regions of our brains seem to be activated when we're seeking information in online environments, when we're making connections in online environments, and it takes a different amount of time. I won't say it takes more or less, it takes a different amount of time. So maybe that's where we need to begin, but I really don't have an answer. <clears throat> but like I said, I can go on and on. Yeah, I'll stop now, thank you. Thank you. Can I give a, a very low level response in terms of the, the recruitment stuff? So there were th the three particular things that uh, at U of T we've kind of you know, debated this a whole lot. In terms of what we can do with our MOOCs to help them become recruitment devices as opposed to, you know, um, to just, the, just the, the learning objective itself. So one is the topic. Uh, it's, it's critically important to pick topics for MOOCs that don't replace a university course. They, you know, they're higher level uh, topics. They integrate across disciplines. They get people excited about an idea, and I think that's key. So having a MOOC on Psychology 101 uh, hasn't helped us uh, recruit. But having a MOOC on uh, making better choices uh, has, right? Uh, because now it's a new way of thinking about it. So, so the topic is critical in the way it's, it's packaged and framed as critical. Two, uh, in the design of the MOOC itself, as many opportunities as you can to make connections with what's happening at the university. Uh, that would then help that people, uh, the, the students take the skill and, and refine it more, I think is great. So we had uh, options where they could interact with our labs or they got to see what our various scientists, uh, social scientists are doing in, in, the, in the site group and so on and so forth. And so they had Google Hangouts with these various people. And so you know that was m more an option for students to learn about what's happening at the school. And then third, within the context of the MOOC design itself, critically important to be able to demonstrate to students themselves that they have learned something and not just through a quiz and success at a quiz. Uh, so I, you know, I come from the world of marketing. That was my, my first job. Uh, we always talk in advertising about having a vivid demonstration. Cheer at two washing machines, one with cheer, one with something else. You know, linen comes out, this is whiter than that. That's what you want to do. Uh, and so you know, having a project at the end where the student knows, well, look, based on these six weeks, I was able to write a policy paper. I was able to. Uh, you know, change the way in which people make healthcare choices. I mean, th that is critically important, and, and we've tried to do that in all of our MOOCs. So those three things, I think, at the design level, make a big yeah. difference. UNESCO came out with uh, an ICT framework for teachers, mainly elementary teachers, secondary teachers. They came up with three competencies. Technology literacy, deep understanding, and knowledge creation. 
So we think that knowledge creation is for us at the university level, with our students, our grad students. The way technology has evolved and the new affordances, we can see that even at the elementary level, you can start that. You can start the socialization into the process. So this is why very much I'm coming up with saying that the future of MOOCs for me is let's root what we do in collaborative research. The, the colleagues with whom we work at the research level, and let's build a MOOC together where our students can benefit from our own, our own knowledge and the knowledge of our colleagues within one community of knowledge. Thank you. Well, if you allow me a brief comment, uh, we talked about transformations in undergrad education, but when you look at the hobbies of our presenters, you also witness some change in the academia. One is into sailing, the other one is into cricket, and the other one is into heavy metal. <laughs> so I think that's, that, that was a nice blended uh, bunch of presenters. Well, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour votre, présent, pour votre présentation pour la session. C'était vraiment très intéressant. Merci. Thank you very much. I think I learned more about teaching in this morning than I did in my whole uh, training as a graduate student. So that tells you something as well. Thank you very much. This is a good way of thinking about how transformations are actually opportunities, opportunities to learn more about teaching. Uh, to keep our energy going, I want to uh, tell you that now it's time for coffee. Uh, so we have a coffee break, which is just next door before the start of our concurrent workshops. And the workshops will allow us to delve into uh, specific topics, and also uh, for you to discover this beautiful um, uh, uh, building that is our faculty club. The big data uh, uh, concurrent session will be here in this room, which is the ballroom. And if you dance a bit, you'll see that it's very springy. It was actually made as a ballroom. Uh, on the second floor is uh, the Shirk Program Architecture Renewal Workshop uh, in the gold room. But the second floor is also the uh, locale of our Maud Abbott Lounge, Maud Abbott being the first woman, and you'll see she was quite a woman, uh, to have been admitted into the faculty club. It's also where you'll find the ladies' lounge, if those of you are looking for the uh, ladies' washroom. And on the third floor, we have the future of Congress in the old McGill room, but the third floor is also home to the billiard room, uh, which you will see is a beautiful room, which was the last place in Montreal where you could actually smoke a cigar. Uh, please don't try that today. Okay, so I uh, now would like to, uh, je vais lever l'auditoire et vous, uh, vous inviter à notre pause café. Merci.